There, here you go, Miss May. One. Just wait, and I'll welcome everybody, and then you, I'll ask you to pray. Right. You can. I don't have to hold the microphone, do it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I want to welcome everyone here to New Life Bible Church for a Wednesday night Bible study. <clears throat> we've got a lot of good things going on. Uh, of course, we've got storms in the area and rain, but uh, I just thank the Lord for what's uh, happening. we we got phase one of our uh, roof on. Uh, hopefully that sometime this summer when we get raise the money, We'll do phase two, which will put the building uh, where it needs to be. The community kitchen <clears throat> is uh, feeding a lot of people right now, and I want to thank everyone for donating to that. And uh, just remind you, they, they need partners year-round, So, and that is good ground. We're, we're not only helping the homeless and the poor, but, but since we had the tornadoes uh, that took place here a few weeks ago, we've been helping, helping uh, feed some of the tornado victims too. So that's, uh, that's been a great blessing, and, and everyone that has sown into that ministry will reap a benefit from that. I'm going to ask uh, my wife, Pastor Mabel, to come up and open us up in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus, the name above all names. Lord, we thank you for Jesus dying on the cross. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation, the greatest gift of all. But we thank you, Jesus, for healing and health and prosperity. Lord, we thank you that the, our country is going to get straightened back out from all of this mess that's been going on with this coronavirus. I pray, Lord, that it'll come back quickly economically and i pray for the leaders of the country father i pray that you'd use the ungodly ones in spite of themselves and i pray that you'd help the ones who are striving to do what you would have them to do help them to continue on and be successful and lord we thank you we thank you for the body of christ we thank you for the fivefold ministry and lord we just pray that tonight you'll have your way and i pray that keith will be able to Teach your word fluently and teach your word under the anointing. And I pray for all pastors throughout the world that's striving to preach and teach the gospel. I pray that you'd bless them and bless their homes and their families. And Holy Spirit, we just welcome you tonight and ask you to have your way. And Father, I speak peace and I speak joy and I speak comfort and I speak help and I speak prosperity over all of our church family. And Father, I pray that our church family and the whole body of Christ will awake to righteousness and sin no more. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, I've got some prayer requests just because the government shut down and uh, everybody's in a panic. The church doesn't stop. And um, we've got some serious prayer requests. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for these individuals. We've seen a lot of miracles uh, not only in Brother Norville's ministry, but here we've seen a lot since we've been here the last four years. And I just praise the Lord uh, uh, for everything that He's doing. This is a this is a decade of speaking and deliverance. So you have not because you ask not. So I want to first lift up um, uh, a nephew of uh, Sister uh, Cecil's, Charles. Uh, he's suffering from pneumonia, so let, let's just pray. Let me pray for him right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority. I take authority over the situation over Charles right now. And Lord, we enter in before your presence into the, into the spiritual realm, Lord. And we invoke the name of Jesus on behalf of Charles. I curse pneumonia. I curse pneumonia in him right now, Father. You, you're not limited by time or space. I curse pneumonia in him. I command it to die and leave his body. And by the stripes of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, I declare him healed in the name of Jesus. He came to heal all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. And I praise you right now, and I declare him healed right now. Charles, in the name of Jesus, is healed by his stripes. Lord, I also bring up uh, uh, Brother uh, Brian Guerin. 
Father, you, I thank you that you've anointed this ministry to call forth new, new hearts. And Lord, I speak to his heart right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I come against the works of the devil. I come against the works of the devil right now over Brian. I speak to his heart and I call forth a creative miracle in the name of Jesus. I call forth a new heart right now in the name of Jesus. A new heart, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We call it forth. We invoke that name. And Lord, I'm sitting here and your spirits tell me I break the power of the devil over Charles, over, over this uh, 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 pneumonia. I curse it and I command it to die in the name of Jesus. And I thank you right now. I thank you that he's healed. I thank you that, uh, that Brian has a new heart. I raise up Terry Buckner right now. I, I speak to his eyes and I command him to be healed in the name of Jesus. I command him to be healed in the name of Jesus. Father, they will correct themselves. They'll be right where they need to be. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. And he also has heart problems, Lord. And I speak a new heart into him right now. You're the God, you're the creative God, the God of signs and wonders, and we speak a new heart into him in the name of Jesus. I come against sleep acne over Brian in the name of Jesus. I curse it and command it to leave his body. He'll have a good night's sleep. He'll breathe properly. He'll have no problems in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I just thank you, and I praise you, and I honor you, and I loose the angels of heaven the ministering of spirits to go about and bring about these miracles, Lord, these healings in the name of Jesus. I thank you and I praise you and I honor you and I glorify you. And Lord, I raise up everyone that's on the prayer book and in the prayer book right now in the name of Jesus, everyone that is called, everyone that's texted us or uh, emailed us or, 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 or asked for a requ uh, prayer request uh, online or any other way, I thank you, Father. We agree with them right now in the name of Jesus. They are healed. Every need is met. Lord, you healed everyone you, you, that came before you, and we thank you for healing everyone that has asked for our prayers, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I, I, I raise up the, the Mayo family right now, and I worship you as, as their healer right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I come against this coronavirus. Father, your word in, in Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus have freed me from the law of sin and death. And I thank you right now in the name of Jesus. No one in this fellowship, in this church, will receive this virus. They're by the stripes of Jesus, it just dies and falls off of us. And Lord, I speak to this virus and I command you to leave this earth in the name of Jesus. We give Jesus all the glory, and I thank you for all those that you've healed here, all the miracles that you're doing in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Oh, and uh, Father, I, Mabel's reminded me, Lord, I raise up Sister Madeline in the nursing home. I plead the blood over her. I, I, I loose uh, uh, the angels to encamp and encircle her and keep her uh, safe. Father, I break the power of the devil around her right now in the name of Jesus. No sickness and disease will come nigh against her. Lord, and I thank you that her mind's sound, and, and, and by the stripes of Jesus, I declare her healed right now. And I send forth the angels to bring it about in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Uh, as the governor uh, let's us operate. Uh, we're, we're beginning to uh, make plans for the future. And the Lord has showed me all the way into uh, actually the uh, 2021. Uh, we're going to make a, a few changes here and there and, and tweak our schedule. But Brother Bill Dennington uh, is going to be coming in in July. And let, me, let me make sure I get the right date here. Uh, I believe it's going to be the third the, the week Monday on the thirteenth, which will be just night meetings, teaching on uh, the authority of the believer. Watch our Facebook uh, uh, ads because I will we'll put an ad out about that. But I'm excited. Bill's got a new book out. He's actually I think written another one and and got another one. He's in the process of writing. And uh, he's got a lot, lot to teach. Uh, I want to bring him in here and teach on uh, fear later on. Uh, probably be next year before I can get him in. But uh, uh, he'll, he's going to bless us in uh, July. 
right now I'm tentatively scheduling Demonology 2020 for the 24th day of August, which is on a Monday. It'll be two meetings at 10, one at 10 and at seven, Monday through Friday. I know Brother Kim and, uh, Pastor Kim and Kreiner and Bridget will be coming in. Uh, uh, John and uh, Pastors John and Vicki Hobson will be coming in. And uh, uh, Janet and Cindy, Sandy Inman will be part of it. Uh, they told me when we postponed it that they feel it really felt a leading to be a part of this demonology. So we're going to have a blast. Now, if, if, if this thing goes on, we'll keep postponing it until we can get a good date. We're wanting to po get it out a few months from now so people can get back to work and, and be able to uh, come and enjoy themselves. Um, Brother Dwayne uh, Norman will be coming back in, and we've got some very special guests that may be here in the next year, and I, I'm not going to even uh, tell you who they are until it's all finalized. But uh, we're going to have some powerful meetings uh, the next 18 months. So be praying for us. If you'd like to help support us, just go to online to norvalhays.org, uh, look at, click on RIM. Uh, you'll see the word fun, uh, highlight it, and the menu will come up, and you can give to our outreach uh, ministry, and that'll help fund all these ministers coming in. We are touching the world. We're going to touch it a whole lot more. Uh, but I, I'm very excited what the Lord's doing. We're getting some things done here that we've been praying about for quite some time. And we've got some things that we really need, some repair works that really need to be done. So um, uh, hopefully by the end of the summer, maybe even before then, I can report that phase two of the roofs will be done. So I just praise the Lord for what he's doing. Tonight, we're going to get back in to grace. Uh, I've got quite a bit of scripture. Uh, I may have to uh, do an extra uh, Wednesday on this. But last week, I talked about sin and repentance. There's, I had to do that, and I'm sure there's some people that don't want to hear what I have to say on that because they won't live any way they want to. But... Um, you you got to understand what grace was put here for. And, and we're going to get into to, um, uh, the teachings uh, in more depth tonight. You're going to find out there's two works of grace. That second work is not being taught in the church today like it should be. And, and it's the one that will change your life greatly. So if you're battling, if you, if you have a problem battling with sin, I, I'm going to show you something tonight that's going to change your life. So if you'll just stay with me and listen, because I'm going to give you scripture on everything. But I'm going to start out, the amplified uh, definition of grace is his unmerited favor and blessing. Everything that is in the Bible is grace. Everything. And you cannot, as I taught last week, you cannot pick and choose a doctrine to get rid of it to make it easier for people. Now, my, my daughter called me today, my oldest daughter, and she just went through the book of Romans, and, and uh, she said it's amazing what's in the book of Romans. Because Romans talks, tells you that you can't sin. These alternative lifestyles that everybody's saying you can live, Romans tells you you can't do that. So I recommend that you do a study on Romans. Get you a King James, read it, get you an Amplified, read it, then find you a third uh, interpretation and read it. And if you'll do that, you, it'll change your life. But ask the Holy Spirit to rightly divide the word because I'm going to tell you something. Paul did not write Romans uh, for the non believer to understand. You've got to have the Holy Spirit to, to interpret what's being said. So, but, it, but it's powerful. And that's what's lacking in a lot of these people that are teaching. Grace is God's ability to do in you, and I'm talking about the second work of grace, is that God's ability to do in you what you uh, don't have the ability to do. Now, the first work of grace was when he put man back in right standing with God. And that way we could be a spiritual being. But I'm going to show you that there is a second work of grace, and I'm going to show you how, how, when it operated in the Bible and how you're to get it to operate. But I want to, I want to uh, read Acts 20, uh, 32 in the Amplified. I read this last week, but you, you need to hear what it says. And now, brethren, 
I commit you to God. I deposit you in his charge, trusting you to, to his protection and care. And I commend you to the word of his grace. Here's the word of his grace, guys. Every word that came out of the mouth of God. To the commandments, the counsels, the promises of his unmerited favor. It is able to build you up and to give you your rightful inheritance among all God's set apart ones, those consecrated, purified, transformed of soul. Now I want to point out something here. You're going to see some things tonight. It said transformed of soul. That's talking about your mind, your emotions, okay? But here, here's what you've got to pay attention in this verse. Grace put us back in right standing with God. Okay, you don't hear any more about that because it's done. There's nobody, that, you can't teach any further on that because he did it on the cross. But here we say it's able to build you up and give you your rightful inheritance. So there's more to grace than just the first work of grace. Grace has the ability to build you up, get you where you're supposed to go, and allow you to inherit the promises of Jesus Christ. So I'm, I'm showing you this so you'll, so you'll know this isn't coming from Keith. This is coming from the Word. Another thing that points to, to, to a second work of grace is, and Paul wouldn't say, made this statement if there wasn't something more to grace. He, in Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that, when we may, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, if you're already saved and not, that's all grace is, how's grace going to help you in the time of need? Because your time of need may not have come yet. So you see the scriptures point to a greater work of grace. So now we're going to get in, we're going, well, and I want to read this uh, also. So there is more to grace than salvation, okay? There's a lot more to grace than salvation. So let's go into our, <coughs> what will be our main text tonight is uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 13. And you have he quickened, who were dead in trespass and sin. Now in the King James, when you see the word quicken, that means made alive. Now you are made alive. Why are you made alive? Because you accepted Jesus. Now you're walking in the Spirit. Verse 2, Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the hour, the the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Of course, we're talking about demonic influence. But the word there, of course, of this world is pointing towards you're going to have, that you, you've had to deal with distractions and degeneration all of your life. See, that's the way the devil operates. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversations in times past in the lust of our flesh, Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, now there's the mind again, and were, and were by nature and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Okay, the, the word conversation there points to your life. You see. It's talking about the type of life. You see, here, here's the thing you've got to realize in everything I'm teaching on Wednesdays and I'm teaching on Sundays right now ties together. I haven't got to it on the cross yet, but there's, there's the front side of the cross, there's the back side of the cross. Grace helped Jesus to take care or, or, or to do what was required of him dying on the cross, but he also could see beyond that cross as to what was going to happen. You know what happened once, once he went to the other side of the cross? We became a new creature. We have a new life. You see, it all ties together. But God, who is, is rich in mercy, for he, His great love wherewith He loved us. 
Now, we're going to teach on love and mercy, but these are key points because what you're going to find out is every, as we read this, these are things that are in every human being. Find the dirtiest scuzzball on earth and, 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 and God's love, mercy, faith, and grace is in him. There is a measure in every, everyone. If not, you couldn't be saved, okay? Now let's go on to verse 5. Even when we were dead in sin, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. So you can't. Now what does this point to you? You've heard me say this many times, and I've been showing you in the Old and New Testament. No work. No work. Jesus did it all. There's no work. It comes by grace. The next verse says, And hath raised us up together and made us set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our spirit man is seated with Jesus in heavenly places right now. Hallelujah. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. You see, we're, we're, uh, Malachi t- tells you that those that serve the Lord, that give testimony and brag on the Lord and, 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 and worship the Lord, he considers us his jewels. You see, he's proud of the work of grace that he's doing in man. And, and let's, let's look at, listen to verse 7 again, that in the ages to come, you get that, Emory, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. See, God's ta- God takes great pride in what he's doing with mankind. For by cra- grace are ye saved through faith. You cannot take faith or one doctrine out of the Bible and see grace work properly. Everything that this is, every doctrine has to, has to be in place. Grace is activated through faith in Jesus and in the Word. Because in a minute I'll show you Jesus is the Word. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So you see, we can't work our way. Now, in a minute, you're going to find out. I'm going to give you two examples of of people that had problems that could not be dealt with in human form. And you're going to see how they were able to overcome these problems, but they didn't work. They didn't work. For we, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in. What are the good works that we're supposed to walk in? You hear me keep saying we don't do any work. We pray, we fast, we read the word, we commune with Jesus. We worship Jesus. That is our works. We don't fix things. We don't cause money to come in. We don't, you know, even though we've got, we've got a lot of ministers today that have been educated and they know how to to get money and how to promote and how to do everything in the world. Now, that's not God's system. God's system is if you preach, a workman is worthy of his hire. If you preach the gospel, all that stuff will come to you. That's what the word says. I don't have to go to college to learn all that. I don't have to buy that book that's on Facebook, how to, how to promote your church. I don't have to do that. Well, you say, Brother Keith, there's not many coming to your church. No, but you know why they're not coming? Because I teach the Word. The Word, people that don't want to hear Jesus Christ, the Word will run them off quicker than anything. But the people that want to know something about Jesus, the Word will draw them in. And it started, guys, uh, Sister, I talked to Sister Janet just uh, yesterday and you, and you wouldn't believe uh, the Lord, the Holy Ghost is beginning to draw people to the ministers of, of the gospel. And he gave me an example of Haberty's Islands. And I, I've shared that with y'all before. It's starting to happen now. That's a sign of the, of the outpouring coming. 
Let me catch up uh, where I'm at here for. For, well, let me just read verse 10 again. For we, we are his workmanship created in, in Jesus Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in this world. Now that's where the, Jew, or the Gentiles were at. But now in Christ Jesus, ye whom sometime were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now, I want to point something out to you. He didn't say that you were made nigh by the grace. Grace is your ability not to sin. The blood is what covers sin. We were brought into right fellowship because of the sacrificial system that he created with the Jews, and Jesus met all of those things. He was without sin. He hung on the cross, tempted in everything. You know, I had a lady get upset because I said he had the opportunity to, to t get the coronavirus. You know why he didn't? Because there was no sin in him. He knew how to say, it is written, by, by his stripes I'm healed. But you see, he had to be tempted and tested and all this. Anything that me and you go through, Jesus had to overcome. And that's why I went into some detail about the cross and, and how he was beaten and suffered. He, he chose the most horrible death that man could die because in it was all the things that we, we would suffer, you see. So we're, we're seeing four gifts that all mankind's got in this, in this passage. God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, and, and, and God's faith. And he gives it to you because he is a merciful God, he's a loving God, and he's full of grace. And he's, he's just give us all this. Now I want, I want to point out something you need to keep, keep in mind. Grace and faith do not work unless you're operating in love and mercy first. You've got, to, you've got to operate in His love and His mercy. Then you'll see uh, grace and faith operate. Okay? Hallelujah. Now, I want to, I want to point out something and, uh, to you, and I hope I don't confuse you. And I, I, I explain it this way, but uh, uh, let me say this first. Faith deals with things that are in your life. I need finances. I need healing. Uh, I need my brother healed or whatever. I, those are what I call things. Grace deals with personal issues within yourself. The dark things, the sin that you can't overcome, uh, uh, the things that you know you need to change in your life, but you just don't have the ability to do it. Faith can't change that. You can stand in faith all you want to. You can't change those dark areas, okay, through faith. But by having faith and standing in grace, you can change them. And I'm, I'm about to show you how to do it in just a second. But let me give you at least a scripture to back up what I'm saying. Titus 2, 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. That's the first work of grace. Okay, grace came by the blood of Jesus, okay. Ephesians 2, 13. John 1, starting at verse 1. Y'all have heard this, but there's a lot of information in this passage here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let me point out something. Jesus is the Word. That's what it just said there. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. The lost can't understand Jesus. They can't understand the plan of God. Now what does the light point to? His grace. 
what we consider the light is ever all of his work everything that enlightens us every, everything we see came by his grace so it re, the life represents his grace verse 12 that was verse 4 and 5 verse 12 but as many as received him to to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believed on his name. Power. Why do you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? To receive the power to walk in this, in this life. Okay? To fulfill your ministry. And the Word was made flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the word truth there point, also points to the word. You can take, and I, I didn't uh, write the uh, verse down, but uh, you can interchange truth, word, and Jesus and not lose any meaning whatsoever. Jesus was full of word and grace. Verse 16 and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. See, as we're taking him in, grace is just flooding us, guys. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, this is important. Why? First of all, he was full of grace and truth. The first manifestation of grace in man is light. The moment you get saved, you're changed. You begin to see the things of God. You begin to have an understanding and enlightenment of God. Okay? Now I want to say this. Old Testament grace is not our grace. Grace in the Old Testament was favor with man and was on the outside of man. Our grace is on the inside of us. Why? Because the one that is full of the word and grace is Jesus and his holy temple is in our bellies. Okay? Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the, in the flesh. The righteousness of of the law, that the, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See, it's all about your relationship, okay? For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. If you want to change your life, start chasing the Spirit of God. Start inviting Him into your life. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If you're spiritually minded, guys, every time I, pray, every time I sit down and meditate about this coronavirus and start praying, I start laughing. I have no fear of this virus whatsoever. Couldn't if I wanted to. Why? Because I'm walking in life and peace. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Because the carnal mind, mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Neither can, neither indeed can be. You see, this mind can't yield itself on its own. It can through the Spirit, but not, not without Him. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't please God if you don't walk in faith. You can't please God if you're in the flesh. So what do you got to do? You got to fill yourself up with the Word, and you got to start walking in the Spirit. Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, whom was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he might, by the grace of, 
that he might, the grace of God, should taste death for every man. See, he just didn't taste death for me and you. He tastes death for every man. Millions, if not billions, will, will go to the lake of fire, even though Jesus died for them. So now, let's get to some examples. I've been showing you, you've got to walk in the Spirit. You've got to chase after God. You've got to have a, 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 a personal walk with Him. You've got to fill yourself up with the Word. And, and I've even mentioned now that you've got to begin to, to walk in grace. How can you walk in the second work of grace? All of you know how to walk in the first stage because of grace because you got saved. Okay, the two, well, there's two examples in the Bible. And if you argue with these two examples, there's no hope. Okay? Mark 14, 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I and I shall pray. This is Jesus speaking. And he taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be so amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful in death. Tarry here, ye here, and watch. So now, he's telling them the state he's in. If I, if I go to uh, Matthew 26, 36, it will give a, even a more vivid detail of the battle he's going through. Okay, but I'm not going there tonight. Uh, but he gave the disciples some instructions, okay? Tarry here and watch. This is very important. Because in a, and I'll show you in a minute. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and pray, prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He was asking God not to die on the cross. See, you, people, people get so religious, they forget that Jesus was a God-man. He was living in a realm, the same realm that me and you live in, suffering exactly the same things we suffer the, even though he was God. Yes, he had the power to change things, but he didn't. We could not be redeemed if he had of. And he's saying, Lord, let this pass. Anybody, because you got to realize something about Jesus. He knew what was coming. He knew how violent a death he was going to die. <coughs> All this he knew. As a man... He did, when, when they hit him with the cat of nine tails, that's, uh, he knew how bad that was going to be. He knew all the pain and the suffering. And he said, Lord, I, I just don't want to do this. In verse 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. He made a, a statement of faith. You see, faith doesn't, grace will not operate without faith, guys. Take away this cup from me. He asked him again. But then he come back. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. See, he's making a statement of faith. Verse 37. And he cometh and findeth them asleep. Now the men that he said to watch, he said he found them asleep. And he said unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest thou not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray. Now pay attention to this statement. He's told them to watch already. They didn't do it. Then he said, watch ye and pray lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. Now remember when he died, he took on man's weakness on the cross. Okay? And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. 
So you see, he's still, he's still begging God, don't, don't let me go for this, but he's speaking faith at the same time. And when he returned, he found them sleep again. Their eyes were heavy, neither wist they that what to answer him. And he came and he, and he cometh the third time. So now he's went back a third time, Trudy, and bade God let this pass from me. But he's saying the same thing, your will be done. He's speaking faith. So he's up there and he, in verse 41, and, and he cometh the third time and saith unto them, sleep now and take your rest. It is, it is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Rise up, let's go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Now all of a sudden, it all changed. He prayed three times. And, and, and trust me, guys, he was crying out to God. Okay? If you read the other version, it, 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 you can see it a little more in that. But then all of a sudden, after the third time, he came, okay, guys, I've been betrayed, let's go, it's time. He led them to, to his crucifixion. How'd that happen? Jesus in the garden was the most powerful display of grace in history. See, Jesus being a man, he could not overcome his fears. He had no special ability, even though he was God. He had, he had set that aside from him. He was operating just like you and me. And when he went before the Lord three times, he was calling on God's grace to get him through what was coming. And this is probably the greatest work of grace in history. But there's another thing here that I want to point out to you, and you, you may see it and you may not. Why did, he, why did he tell those disciples, watch and pray? Why did he say, uh, to avoid the air of, the, the air of, air of temptation? See, Jesus was a teacher. Jesus was telling them what to do to walk in grace. But they weren't catching on to it. I will tell you this, if they had them, they would have changed. And Jesus knew they wasn't going to. See, he already knew this, how it was going to work out. But what he was doing was making those statements so that we could come back and realize that Jesus was telling us, just as I sought the grace of the Father, you can too. He was telling those men, if you would be praying and calling on God's grace to overcome what's coming, coming you, would, you would overcome and avoid the air of temptation. Now, what would that have meant? That would have meant Peter wouldn't have denied him. That would have meant all of them wouldn't. And that would have changed everything so they didn't catch on. It wasn't meant for them to. But what I want you to see here is that Jesus was setting the stage for me and you, okay? He was telling them, you need to be praying. Things are getting bad. You need to be praying. Remember? In the time of need to come before the, boldly before the throne of grace. That's what he's telling these disciples. So that's witness number one. Let everything be established by two or three witnesses. Prayer brings grace. So let's look at Paul. Second Corinthians, I'm doing pretty good on time. Second Corinthians 12, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I, I should be exalted above measure. Now, guys, I have, I've had it, heard every kind of story of Paul's thorn in the flesh and this, and, and uh, Basically, uh, what I consider probably would be is all the people that was coming against Paul. 
Now, I've had, I, I taught this one time and a guy just blasted me, oh, you're crazy, it's this and it's that. Truth is, nobody can tell you what that thorn in the flesh was. But if you read his life and you read it as many times as I have, his main problem was he was dealing with people that didn't want nothing to do with him, working against him. He's having trouble with people all the time. Guess what? Happens to every minister. So, so he, he was given a problem, and that's what we're going to call it. Whatever it is, it don't matter. Here's what he said. For this thing, whatever that problem is, whatever that mountain is, I besought the Lord, how many times? Thrice. How many times did Jesus pursue God for grace? Three times. That it might depart from me. Now here's what God told him. He's man, this man of faith. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, affirm, affirmity there is not sickness. That's, uh, that could mean any kind of battle you're going through. Now, what did we talk about? What did we talk about the cross? Jesus had to become weak. When me and you become weak, God gets stronger. When, when we begin to take action, God will take action. God doesn't deliver me and you out of the fire. He, he, deliver, he, he, he walks with us through the fire. See, too many people in the church has got in their head that God's just going to snap his finger and you're not going to go through nothing. No. When it comes to persecution, things of that, just like Jesus had to suffer, you've got to suffer. What will he do? He will walk through it, take you through it. No plague will come nigh my dwelling. If you're in the most secret place of the Most High, you're, going, you're in a bubble. You're just looking at it as you go through. It's not touching you. <coughs> just like they went through the Red Sea. Can you imagine being hundreds of feet underwater and, and looking at fish swimming around just like you was in an aquarium, but there's no glycer? <coughs> nothing, nothing touched them. You see, Paul was in a state he couldn't do nothing. He was weak. And Jesus was saying, my grace is sufficient. He prayed three times. Paul went on and done everything the Lord wanted him to do. Verse 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproach, reproaches and necessities and persecutions <coughs> and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then, he, then am I strong. <clears throat> Another reason I can say that it was people that was his problem is he didn't list, he didn't list sickness and disease right there. His problem was persecuted. Okay, let me reread it. Uh, in, in repro well, infirmities, which does not necessarily mean sickness. Okay, in reproaches and necessities and in persecution and distresses for the sake of Jesus. He was doing the work of the ministry. Okay? But when I am weak, then am I strong. Why? Because he called on, three times he called on the grace of Jesus to get him through it. And that grace made him strong. Remember, the second work of grace is God's ability to do in you what you can't do. Paul couldn't do it. Jesus couldn't do it. The grace could. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that hence we should not serve sin. Why am I reading that right now? You're battling with sin. You've got anger issues. You've got lust issues. You've got whatever issue. Call on the grace of Jesus. If you'll put your case before him, the unjust judge says that, that, that the answer will come speedily. You'll be, you'll be amazed, and I'm going to tell you how it'll come, and, don't, uh, and you've got to pay attention to when you start asking God for grace. There's not going to be a big electrical moment, and your hire stands up, and you're going to shake, okay? 
You just gonna be walking down the street one day and realize, you know, that problem I've been battling with for years, and I prayed for grace a few days ago, it's not there no more. I don't have no problem with it anymore. It just goes away. Well, Brother Keith, it can't be that easy. It's that easy, my brothers and sisters. Romans 6, 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey the, it in the lust of the flesh. Neither yield. Now you see, here's, here's the secret. What you're yielding yourself to is what you're getting. Neither yield yourselves, members, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to, to whom you obey, neither uh, either of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You see, you choose to be righteous. Every day you take up your cross. That's something I taught Sunday. You pick up that cross and you have to yield yourself to Jesus. Now here, here's, here's what I want you to understand. You, you could be the biggest sinner on earth if you will yield yourself to Jesus the process of faith, mercy, love, and grace will begin to operate in your life. And if you will call out to him and ask him to deliver you from this, the grace will begin to operate and, and these things will, will be overcome. See, we're not teaching this in the church like we should. We're casting devils out of people that don't have a devil problem. They've got a grace problem. They need, the, they need the grace of Jesus. But now here's the thing you've got to realize, guys. And I deal with I, I, the last couple that I dealt with. I, as soon as I dealt with them, everything I prayed for them, they came back and admitted God did for them, but they're still serving the devil. You know why? They wouldn't put the word in them, and they would not have a relationship with Jesus. They had to have their relationship their way. That, that's not the way it works, guys. A lot of people don't need the deliverance. They need to ask for the grace to overcome the dark areas of their life. Hallelujah. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. And we've read this, but I'm going to read a bigger version of it or a, a more of it so you can see it. Seeing then that, that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. A lot of people won't put confession in there. What's our profession? Who we are, what we're walking in. We're walking in the grace and faith of Jesus Christ. We're walking in righteousness. We must hold to that. That's why I'm a certain group of people that are killed are called martyrs because they didn't deny their faith. They held to it even in, in worst of times. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Going back to the cross. He felt everything that me and you can ever feel. I'm going to say this. Most of us have not felt everything that a human being can feel. Some of us have been blessed, but he felt all of it. And because of that, you can go to him and he can get you through this because he knows what you're going through. But with, in all points, tempted as we are, but yet without sin. So he went through it. Then he goes on to say, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Didn't say get find faith. 
said to find grace. So we can overcome sin. Now grace doesn't cover sin. Blood covers sin. That tells me if you're going to have grace operating in your life, you've got to get saved. You've got, you've got to be repentant of your sins and apply the blood. And as you do that, ask the Lord to give you the grace not to, not to commit that sin again. See, grace is not God's ability to, to sin. It's the God's ability to overcome. Ephesians 2 taught, spoke of the, of the blood. John 1 spoke of the life. Now I'm going to get into some, real quick, into some Old, Old Testament and a few New Testament, and I'm going to show you something. And I'm going to show you something about King David. Okay, Leviticus 17, 11. For the life, now we're right back, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your what? Souls. The atonement wasn't for your body, it was for your souls. Get your mind in it back where it's supposed to be. That's why I break soul ties off of people. For it is the blood that make an atonement for the soul. You got to put your you got to put your your mind under the blood of Jesus so it'll be healed. Blood covers sin. Grace covers life. It's a good way to understand it. If it's a life issue, you need grace. If it's a sin issue, you need blood. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, or the word, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. No man. Now, you, see, you can see it in the, super, uh, the sacrificial system that God set up. And I'm going to read these real quick. There's five sacrifices under the sacrificial system. The burnt offering points to, to surrendering your life to God. The meat offering points to man giving back to God. The peace offering points to man having communion with God. The sin offering points to the sin nature or putting you back in right standing with God. And the trespass offering points to your being cleansed of sin after you're saved everyday sins. Okay? And, and there's, I'm not going to go into, the, uh, I've got some stuff listed here, the confession of sins, but, but all through the Old and New Testament. Zacharias 13, 1 says, in, the day, uh, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for, for sin and for uncleanliness. Now this is an important verse you've got to remember because King David knew this verse. Okay. Psalms 51, this is King David, okay? And you want, you want to pay attention to this. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. What was the first thing he asked for? God's mercy. Why? King David understood that the mercy, God's mercy seat set above, above the law and everything, Okay? Now, King David had committed sins that he, he could, did not supposed to survive, or he should have been stoned to death. He calls on the mercies of God, <clears throat> according, and I'm going to go on, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, my sins. Wash me thoroughly from thine inequities, inequities and cleanse me from my sin. What's he doing asking for that? <clears throat> he's under the law. That sounded like a New Testament guy right there. King David understood what the law pointed to. He was in a situation that, that he was to die. He's calling on the mercies of God. He is putting himself, he is repenting of his sins, and he is putting himself under the blood. For I acknowledge, and here's repentance, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. 
that thou mightst be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. I mean, he's, he's admitting to sin. Now, you, you're not going to get it. He's talking to God. Behold, I was shapen in inequity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in my inward parts and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Verse 7. Purge me with hyssop. Hyssop there means blood. Purge me with the blood and I will be cleansed. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide my face from my sins and blot out all my inequities. See, under the Old Testament, you were only pardoned from your sins, but he's talking about doing away with them. New Testament, guys. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God. Thou God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O God, open thy, thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praises. See, he's going right back to relationship. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God, now listen to this, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. He's saying that if you come humbly before the Lord and present yourselves to the Lord in right attitude, confessing your sins, pleading the blood, and it be heartfelt, God will wash it all away. Okay? And this man was a man after God's own heart. 1 John 1, 9. New Testament now. If we confess our sins, that's what King David was saying, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should, should live soberly, righteously, and God, godly in, the, in this present world. There is benefits to following the Word. Grace is not for me to live in this world. Now listen to this. Grace isn't here for me to live in this world. It helps me to overcome this world. But grace is for me to live in God's world. Sin, contrary to what a lot of people want to talk, teach you, these alternative lifestyles, they are a barrier between you and God. You'll never get to where you need to be in God operating in sin. Grace is God's ability to help you to overcome sin. What is the benefit of overcoming sin? You, are in, you, you move into God's world and you begin to operate with a freedom. Uh, and this world just really had nothing, nothing to do with you anymore. You overcome this world through His grace. You use faith in this world to help overcome things in this world. But grace allows you to overcome this world through Jesus. And Jesus paid that price. So when you take up, when you take up his cross, 
you have a relationship with him and you come under his grace you're a new creature grace is operating in you he's doing all the work all you're doing is just keep following him now let me let me say one more thing and and i'm going to close out how do we get this work of grace to operate one you want to be saved you would be best to be filled with the holy ghost but even if you're not filled with the holy ghost what i'm about to tell you will work You get down on your knees and you ask God to help you over that for the grace to overcome whatever your need is. And if you look at Matthew 7 through 11 in the Amplified Luke 11, 9, Amplified Luke 18, 1 through 8, or Matthew 6, 6, all of these talk about prayer. All of these things that are taught about prayer will put you in the realm where grace can operate. As you, you, go, you, you get on your knees and the Lord said that if you'll pray uh, in your closet privately, I will reward you openly. Ask and you shall, it'll be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. You've got to start asking God for the grace, just like Paul did, just like Jesus did. It'll change your life. Why the church is not teaching this I don't know. I can tell you, Trudy would know the man I learned this from. He taught it in 1988, and I've never heard anybody teach it since. But it's right here plain in the Word. Grace changes you. Faith changes everything around you. But you must have faith to operate in the grace to change you. Faith in the name of Jesus Christ. If you don't have any other thing going on in your life, you don't need grace, ask God to give you the grace and the revelation to understand the name of Jesus. If you're a minister and you're not operating in the gifts that God has revealed to you that you're supposed to, go boldly before the throne of grace and ask Him to allow you to begin to operate. Ask Him to give you the grace to allow you to operate in, in, in those giftings that He said He's going to give to you. If you've got rage in your life or hatred, ask God for the grace to overcome that and ask Him for, the mercy, for Him to build up the mercy and love in you that, that you do have. You have a measure of all that in you. Faith, love, mercy, and grace. You can build it. There's no limit. There's no place in the Bible that that puts a limit on any of those things whatsoever. I can't tell you how great a faith you can walk in. I can't tell you how great a mercy you can walk in, how great a love There's references in the Bible. There's much grace. There's great grace. There's greater grace. The only way for you to ever understand the depths of all this is to start walking in it. And as the the world presents issues in your life, use it to overcome those issues. But you see, that's what grace is for. Grace is to get you through this life. It's it's not to give you a ticket to go live any way you want to. We have a standard. It's called the Word of God. This Word is Jesus. We live by His standard. We're like Him. He was with no sin. We're supposed to be with no sin. The only way me and you're going to do it is by walking in His grace and grabbing a hold of His coattails and hanging on. There's no other way, guys. And I can tell you right now, next year, there'll be somebody come out with another teaching and they'll want to leave something else out of this book and tell you that you can do it this way. It's much easier. No. No. The grace of God is every word that proceeded out of his mouth. Every word. And there is not a man on this earth that has a right to say one word of this word is not in effect today. It's all in effect. And me and you will be judged by every word that's in this book. Every word. This word is the word of grace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you right now and I ask that you'll quicken this message, make it alive to everyone that hears it. 
I thank you and I agree with those that are in battles that are battling things in the, the darkness in their lives, that the life and the light of Jesus will come in, that the grace of God will operate and they'll overcome it right now in the name of Jesus. I praise you, I thank you, and I honor you, Lord. I thank you for the privilege of being able to teach. But Lord, I thank you for all the lives that are going to be changed. And I thank you for bringing the people that need to hear this to, to all of our uh, media. Lord, that they'll be able to hear your word and their lives will be changed. I praise you for touching everyone that we've prayed for. Those that we've not prayed for that have needs online. I thank you, Lord, as they lay their hands out. I agree with them right now. I agree with them to be healed, delivered, set free, prosper. Their families will, will know you. I agree right now, Father. And Lord, you sent your word. Lord, you sent your word out. And it does not come back void. It, it not only accomplishes what it's been sent out to do, but it prospers. And I call this done in the name of Jesus. Every need is met. And Lord, I thank you for being with the leaders of this country. I thank you for being with all the people. Comfort those that have lost loved ones, Lord. And I give you honor and praise. And I thank you for what you're about to do on this earth and what you have already done on this earth, Lord. Because great, great are you. And I praise you and I worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you and good night. Are we clear?